Could I have your attention, please? Ladies and gentlemen, could I have your attention? Ladies and gentlemen, could I have your attention? Good morning and welcome back to the first full day of the second International Conference on Climate Change. I'm Dan Miller from the Heartland Institute, and I'm still recovering from last night, which had to be one of the most intellectually exciting evenings I've spent in the last year or so. An excellent job. President Klaus is with us today still, and I'm delighted to see him. Thank you, Mr. President. As, ex as exciting as yesterday was, today you're going to hear new information, new data, new insights, new analysis of climate change and global warming, about the science behind it and the politics behind it as well. And the man to lead you today as the master of ceremonies is James Taylor. He's the man who recruited all of the speakers you're going to hear and you did hear yesterday and you will hear for the next day and a half. James is a, an attorney out of Syracuse, undergraduate from Dartmouth College. He's also the, he's a senior policy advisor at the Heartland Institute on Environmental Matters. He is the managing editor of Environment and Climate News, a monthly newspaper of climate and energy science that reaches 74,000 people every issue. He's a fearsome debater. His work has appeared in hundreds, thousands of publications, and he will speak at the opening of a manhole cover if it means that he can confront an alarmist. Ladies and gentlemen, my colleague, James Taylor. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2009 International Conference on Climate Change. And hey, weren't President Klaus and Dr. Lindzen absolutely fabulous last night? And the best part of all is we've only just begun. As Heartland Institute President Joe Bast noted last night, we have an outstanding lineup of 80 experts from all over the world presenting an impressive array of scientific data indicating that global warming is not a human-induced crisis and that proposals to significantly reduce carbon dioxide emissions would have a devastating negative impact on human welfare. I would at this time like to extend a very warm welcome to Al Gore, James Hansen, Michael Mann, Gavin Schmidt, and all the other prominent proponents of a global warming crisis who accepted our invitation to present their data and theories at this conference. Oh, wait a moment. My mistake. Not a single one of, uh, of these uh, prominent proponents accepted our offer to speak at this conference. But why should this conference be any different from so many others, where the spokesmen of gloom and doom refuse to publicly debate and defend their speculations? As Al Gore made it oh so clear Thursday at the Wall Street Journal's economics conference, we are supposed to accept the alarmist claims at face value, merely taking them on their word that we are facing a global warming crisis, rather than adhering to the scientific method and encouraging open and transparent critical inquiry. On one side of the issue, we have scientists who encourage open discussion and debate. On the other side, we have scientists who seek to suppress it. Now, what's the, now what does that tell you? The scores of experts speaking at this conference serve as a bulwark on behalf of the time-honored and scientifically necessary principles of critical inquiry and transparent discussion. We all owe you a debt of gratitude for your diligent and courageous work. Thank you very much for being here this morning. It is just as important that our elected representatives show the courage to stand up for sound science and critical inquiry. The easy thing for our representatives to do is to act concerned about global warming and pass laws to quote unquote solve the purported problem. The courageous thing to do, however, is to forget about politics, study the facts, and vote according to the science, the economics, and your conscience. Our first keynote speaker has a proven track record of doing just that. Congressman Tom McClintock served the citizens of California for 22 years in the California State Legislature 
before being elected to the U.S. Congress in 2008. In addition to his longstanding public service, Congressman McClintock has served as director of the Center for the California Taxpayer and director of economic and regulatory affairs for the Claremont Institute's Golden State Center for Policy Studies. As a member of the House Resources Committee, Congressman McClintock has vowed to stand up for sound science and demand that proposed global warming legislation be based on facts rather than unsubstantiated fears. He is no stranger to this issue. As a member of the California legislature, for many years he courageously put his political capital on the line, speaking out in the media and voting according to the science and according to his conscience. It is my pleasure to introduce to you a bulwark in the U.S. Congress, assuring that the science and economics presented at this conference will not go unnoticed in the halls of Congress. Ladies and gentlemen, Congressman Tom McClintock. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and you're welcome. Uh, I have to tell you, I am a little nervous uh, to accept your kind invitation to come here uh, to New York City to discuss global warming. Uh, I recall that it was right here in this city um, a year and a half ago uh, that no less an authority than Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said that those of us who still have some questions about their uh, theories of man-made global warming are, and I quote in order, liars, crooks, corporate toadies, flat earthers, and then he made this remarkable statement, this is treason and we need to start treating them now as traitors. Ah, the dispassionate language of pure science. <laughs> now, I don't want to die a traitor's death, so I want the record to be very clear. I believe the Earth's climate is changing and that our planet is warming. And I have to tell you, this is somewhat of a sore subject with me. You see, it was me, Tom McClintock, who discovered the theory of global climate change, not Al Gore, and yet all you hear about is Al Gore this and Al Gore that. My, uh, my climate change discovery came in the fall of 1964, long before the world had ever heard of Al Gore, when Miss Conroy took our third grade elementary school class to the Museum of Natural History. Uh, it was there that we saw a panorama of dinosaurs uh, tromping around the steamy swamps of what was once uh, now part of Wyoming. And now that panorama was right next to the exhibit of woolly mammoths foraging on the glaciers uh, that were also once the same part of Wyoming. And I thought to myself, gee, those dinosaurs look cool. And then I thought to myself, oh my God, the climate must be changing from time to time. And I never got a Nobel Prize for that discovery. In fact, many years later, I learned that Ms. Conroy had never even nominated me for the Nobel Prize. So instead of getting to jet around the world in a fleet of Gulfstream 5s to tell people uh, they need to feel guilty about driving to work, uh, I have to take the subway. And I don't get paid $100,000 a speech for my original discovery. But then again, I don't have Al Gore's electricity bill, so I suppose it all balances out. You do have to admit there's a certain Helmsley-esque quality to it all. We don't conserve, only the little people conserve. Well, anyway, a few years after uh, making my discovery about the planet's climate changing, I got to high school in the 1970s, and I learned from the Al Gores of the time that we foolish mortals were actually plunging ourselves into another ice age. And that was, after all, beyond dispute. All the scientists agreed. Um, and, and by the way, you, uh, you might have seen the Washington Times story last year about a uh, researcher who uh, stumbled upon a lurid story published in the Washington Post dated July 9, 1971. It included the scary headline, U.S. Scientist Sees New Ice Age Coming. Well, the scientists based this on a uh, scientific climate model developed by a young research associate named anyone, anyone, James Hansen. They warned that uh, continued carbon emissions over the next 10 years could trigger a runaway ice age. 
And it was rather amusing because a few months before this old newspaper clipping surfaced, the very same James Hansen had published a paper claiming that continued carbon emissions over the next 10 years could trigger a runaway greenhouse effect. Well, of course, for uh, those in the liberal elite who jet to environmental conferences in Gulfstream 5s and drive around in Hummers singing the praises of hybrids and, and bicycles, uh, the left uh, now sells indulgences. Uh, you can actually car calculate your carbon sins online, and they'll gladly tell you how much money to send them, all major credit cards accepted, uh, to assuage your conscience. In, in fact, I had a uh, friend who paid $45 uh, for one of these carbon offsets uh, for his Lincoln Navigator. By paying $45, you see, this company sends him a very attractive 10 cent decal uh, that certifies that his SUV now has absolutely no carbon footprint. <laughs> but then he discovered that um, Priuses, which do have a carbon footprint, get to use our diamond lanes in California for free, while his Lincoln Navigator, which for just $45 now has no carbon footprint whatsoever, has to sit in a bumper to bumper traffic with all of the rest of us carbon sinners. Now these, uh, these carbon offsets are supposed to be used for such activities as planting more trees uh, to absorb carbon dioxide. After all, young trees absorb an enormous amount of this greenhouse gas, far more than older trees do. But isn't replacing old growth timber with young growth timber exactly what lumber companies were doing until Al Gore's acolytes stopped them? This gets very confusing. Uh, uh, trees are also uh, very important to reducing energy demand. Uh, we're told to conserve electricity. We need to plant lots of uh, shade trees to shield our roofs from the sun so that we don't use our air conditioners. We're also, of course, supposed to install solar panels on our roofs, which don't work very well in the shade from our trees. <laughs> in fact, recently, a uh, Sunnyville, uh, California couple was ordered to cut down the old redwood trees in their own backyard. Why? Well, their neighbor installed solar panels in the shade of those redwoods, and the couple was informed that under state law, they'd be fined $1,000 a day if they didn't cut their redwoods down at once. Now, one word of warning, however, um, even though you have to cut down your own trees at once if a neighbor decides to install solar panels in their shadow, you are forbidden to clear uh, flammable brush from around your home in hazardous fire areas because that is an affront to Mother Nature. I in that case, you're supposed to let it burn uh, and your home along with it uh, because this is the most environmentally friendly way for nature to dispose of carbon trapping vegetation and thereby releasing lots of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Uh, that's also, by the way, why we're supposed to uh, do away with chemical fertilizer and replace it with natural compost because replacing man-made greenhouse gases with natural greenhouse gases is the wave of the future. Another important battle in the war against uh, carbon is to force everyone to use electric uh, cars and trains. But this also gets a little complicated because at the same time we're all supposed to be cutting way back on our electricity usage uh, to the point that the California Energy Commission now wants to require every household thermostat uh, to have a remote control device that will allow the bureaucrats to decide what's the appropriate temperature for your living room. You need to keep your uh, thermostat set to 90 degrees in the summer to conserve electricity, but we'll be happy to spend millions of your tax dollars for you to take an electric bullet train from LA to San Francisco for the weekend. Now, in fact, there are only two ways of generating vast amounts of clean electricity for electric cars and electric trains, and that, of course, is hydroelectricity and nuclear power. But there's no faster way to send one of these Luddites into hysterics than to mention that particular inconvenient truth. The politically correct replacement is solar energy. Solar energy is roughly 17 times more expensive than either nuclear power or hydroelectricity, meaning, of course, around 17 times less electricity to run electric cars and electric trains. Energy conservation, then, is the answer, which is why uh, we're required to use energy-efficient fluorescent light bulbs rather than those warm and fuzzy incandescent ones but wait, California just banned the disposal of fluorescent lights with your trash because of extreme environmental hazards that they pose to our landfills. 
So I admit I approach this subject with uh, an admitted level of confusion as to what these people are thinking. Let me begin by um, asking three inconvenient questions. Uh, question one, if, if global warming is caused by your SUV, why is it that we are seeing global warming on every other body in the solar system? As you know, for the last uh, decade or so, the Martian South Polar ice cap has conspicuously receded. Pluto's warming about two degrees Celsius over the past 14 years. Jupiter's showing dramatic climate change by as much as 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Even Neptune's moon Triton has warmed 5% on the absolute temperature scale, the equivalent of about 22 degrees Fahrenheit uh, here on Earth uh, between 1989 and 1998. And if you have any doubts of that, just Google Pluto warming or Mars warming or whatever your favorite planet or former planet might be. Now, meanwhile, solar radiation has increased a small but measurable five hundredths of a percent since the 1970s. Now, I'm, I'm just thinking aloud here, but do you think it's possible that as, as the sun gets slightly warmer, the planets do too? Now, that would be a little scary in its own right, except for the second inconvenient question. If global warming is caused by your SUV, why is it that we have ample historical records of periods in our recent history when the planet's temperature was much warmer than it is today? We all know during the medieval warm period from about 900 to 1300 AD, wine grapes were thriving in northern Britain and Newfoundland. Uh, the temperature in Greenland was warm enough to support a prosperous agricultural economy for nearly 500 years. That's, after all, why they called it Greenland. Uh, that period was brought to an end by the Little Ice Age that lasted from 1300 until about 1850. And we know that during colonial times, Boston and New York harbors routinely froze over in winter. And during Elizabethan times, the annual winter festival was held on top of the Thames River, which froze solid every year. And finally, the third uh, inconvenient question. If global warming is caused by your SUV, why is it that increases in atmospheric carbon dioxide always follow increases in global temperatures by several hundred years? Again, I'm just thinking aloud here, but is it possible that if the CO2 increases follow temperature increases, that that might possibly mean that increased CO2 is a byproduct of increasing temperatures and not a cause? Now. Al Gore must um, have an answer to those and other questions that have been raised by us uh, treasonous, uh, corporate toady, Holocaust deniers. Uh, you, you've seen an inconvenient truth. Uh, uh, or it, uh, in it, uh, Al Gore portrays himself as a tireless, uh, lonely sentinel, who should have been president, of course, uh, wandering the planet, desperately trying to awaken the world to the danger it faces. Uh, uh, I've given this speech a thousand times, he says, about a thousand times. So I wanted to touch base with all of you today to find out um, when he's planning to accept your institution's uh, invitation for an international debate on the subject. Uh, I'm absolutely certain that this um, pious paragon of truth, who assures us he's willing to go anywhere and talk to anybody to save us from our mortal folly, should be chafing at the bit to show us the error of our ways. As I understand it, the uh, Heartland Institute's offered our Nobel Peace Prize laureate of the left uh, to debate to any one of three internationally recognized authorities and that you're willing to front all costs at Oxford University, no less, and in a uh, format of Gore's own choosing. After all, Gore's book extols the importance of science and reason in the public policy debate. So what better way to deliver the coup de grace to us skeptics than to expose our fallacies in front of an international audience in our own forum. And yet Al Gore, who's given this speech a thousand times, won't give it just once more in a forum where it might actually be questioned by knowledgeable authority. In, in a sense, though, we had that debate in the British courts uh, several years ago. The High Court of Britain uh, determined that there were no less than 11 factual errors on key scientific points in that film and ordered a uh, disclaimer to that effect to be made to any public classroom where the film's shown. We're all told, of course, the debate is over and that all the scientists agree. I like to call this the emperor's new clothes argument. And uh, as all of you know, that is, is simply not the case. Uh, I, I believe it was Ogden Nash who wrote that the ass was born in March, the rains came in November. Such a flood as this, he said, I scarcely can remember. 
But now I'd like to address myself to a serious and grim subject, and that is the actual threat that global warming poses to our planet, and most specifically to California. And that is a very real and devastating one. I speak specifically of the radical policies that the global warmongers are now enacting. In the summer of 2006, in the name of saving the planet from global warming, California adopted the most radically restrictive legislation anywhere on the planet. Uh, it included AB 32, which requires a 25% reduction in man-made carbon dioxide emissions by the year 2020. Now, to put this in perspective, we could junk every car in the state of California right now and not meet that mandate. At about the same time, the same politicians who adopted these measures uh, also adopted $40 billion of bonds that they promised would be used for highways, dams, aqueducts, and other capital improvements. Now, here's the problem. Building highways and dams and aqueducts requires tremendous amounts of cement. How is cement produced? Well, it's produced by taking limestone and superheating it into a molten state. It comes out the other side as a compound called clinker. Clinker is about two-thirds the weight of the original limestone. The missing third of that weight is carbon dioxide. And when you include the emissions required to superheat the limestone, it turns out that for every ton of cement, a ton of carbon dioxide is released. It's the third biggest source of carbon dioxide in all human enterprise. But now we have a law that specifically forbids us from doing so. That was the essence of the lawsuits uh, that were filed against construction projects and are being filed uh, against construction projects across our state. So construction is history. Agriculture is in big trouble too, and agriculture is California's number one industry. You can start with nitrogen fertilizer, which is a critical component of all agricultural activity. Unfortunately, it produces large amounts of nitrous oxide, another so-called greenhouse gas that has to be radically curtailed in California. The wine industry is also in for a shock. Fermentation of wine occurs when a molecule of glucose in the grapes is converted into equal parts of alcohol and carbon dioxide. And the, uh, the biggest agricultural impact is uh, our state administration's mandate for heavily subsidized use of ethanol fuel. Uh, ethanol is produced in exactly the same way as alcohol in wine. Uh, the glucose in corn is converted into equal parts of ethyl alcohol and carbon dioxide. Following AB 32, this administration imposed a requirement that all gasoline sold in California by next year must be comprised of at least 10% ethanol uh, which doubles the current mandate. Now, any of you who brought pocket calculators, pull them out and walk through this with me. One acre of corn produces about 350 gallons of ethanol. There are 15 billion gallons of gasoline used in California each year. So in order to meet the 10% requirement in three years, it means converting 4.3 million acres of farmland to ethanol production. Now that's a lot of farmland considering we only have 11 million of acres uh, producing crops of any kind in California. So the current ethanol mandates are already producing serious shortages in other parts of the world as farmland that had been producing food shifts to ethanol to chase hundreds of millions of dollars of government subsidies that are coming out of our pockets. And we're seeing this across the board including commodities like milk and beef that are responding to increased prices for corn feed. And as you see, uh, your grocery prices rise as a result of this policy. I'd just be glad you're not in the third world. Food is still a relatively small portion of family incomes in affluent nations. It consumes more than half of family earnings in third world countries. So when the global warming alarmists predict worldwide starvation, they're right. They're causing it. Electricity prices are also taking a heavy hit. Uh, California already suffers the highest electricity prices in the continental United States, and that situation is about to get worse. A companion measure to AB 32 was SB 1368. That prohibits the importation of electricity produced by coal, even state-of-the-art EPA-approved power plants thousands of miles from California. Truckee became the first victim of this uh, law, uh, Truckee was about to sign a 50-year contract for electricity produced by a new coal-fired plant 
in the state of Utah. They were forced to back off because of this legislation. Now, the original contract was for $35 per megawatt hour. The green replacement power will cost trucking consumers $65 per megawatt hour. Uh, these radical laws now uh, in place in California are having a dramatic impact on energy production, agriculture, manufacturing, winemaking, construction, carbon transportation, uh, cargo transportation, uh, just to name a few sectors of the economy. And we're already seeing the economic impact uh, in our state. In, until last year, California's unemployment tracked pretty closely with the national figures. But since January of 2007, California's unemployment rate began a radical divergence uh, from the national figures. It's now in double digits and nearly 40 percent higher than the national unemployment rate. Even more ominous are the figures uh, reported by the Census Bureau. In the last three years, two-thirds of a million more people have moved out of California than have moved in. Uh, outbound U-Haul rates are now between six and seven times the cost of renting the same truck to move into California. And you, um, you can't blame the national economy for these developments. For this, you have to look to specific state policy. I was struck by the uh, governor's speech to the United Nations uh, a couple of years ago uh, when he was imposing this lunacy. He told them, quote, last year in California, we enacted groundbreaking greenhouse gas emission standards. We enacted the world's first low carbon fuel standard. Do I believe California standards will solve global warming? No. What we're doing is changing the dynamic, preparing the way, and encouraging the future. So even the individual most responsible for this economically catastrophic public policy admits that it's not going to solve global warming. He just wants to set an example. And in that singular respect, I believe that he has succeeded beyond his wildest dreams. There's one other thing that strikes me on this issue, and that's how puny is the amount of carbon dioxide produced by human enterprise compared to simple natural processes. The AB 32 mandate is to reduce man-made carbon dioxide emissions in California by 170 million metric tons per year. That's what all of this tremendous economic dislocation is about. Now, let me mention one other man-made source of carbon dioxide that they don't count. Every one of us in this room will produce about 2.2 pounds of carbon dioxide today by deliberately, willfully breathing. Now, again, pull out those pocket calculators. That's 800 pounds of carbon dioxide each year. There are 6.6 .6 billion of us on this planet. That comes to 5.3 trillion pounds or 2.4 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide simply through the process of human respiration, and that's before you add in all the cats and rats and elephants around the world. So there are 2.4 billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions worldwide by human breathing, and 170 million metric tons is what all the fuss is about in California. Now, you've all been snickering a lot, and I, I know that watching Californians running amok is, is great sport if you don't happen to live there. It's, it's especially gratifying in New York to know there's at least one other state that's more screwed up than your own. But, <laughs> go ahead and laugh, but let me warn you, if the Luddite left succeeds in wrecking California, there are 49 other states that we're all going to move to, and yours is one of them. <laughs> People love to watch events in California in much the same way as they love to um, gawk at car wrecks. Uh, you feel guilty about it, of course. You know you really shouldn't uh, stare, but you just can't help yourselves. And, and there is, a, there is a, one respectable reason for doing it. When you drive by a wreck, you can tell your children, uh, kids, that's what happens when you don't pay attention while you're driving. And California's wreck is a good time to remind voters, uh, kids, that what, that's what happens when you don't pay attention when you're voting. Uh, while we're on that subject, <laughs> while we're on that subject, the Obama administration has just unveiled its budget, a $3.6 trillion monstrosity that includes some $650 billion in business taxes. Uh, they call it cap and trade, but what they really mean is cap and tax. Uh, the, the, the problem, of course, with business taxes is that uh, businesses don't pay them. Uh, business taxes can only be paid in one of three ways, 
Business taxes are either paid by us as consumers through higher prices, by us as employees through lower wages, or by us as investors through lower earnings, mainly on what's left of our 401ks. And the President's cap and tax plan is going to cost about $2,100 for every man, woman, and child in our nation, or about $8,400 directly out of the purchasing power of an average family of four in the worst economy in a generation. Now, before the nation follows California off a cliff, perhaps we should ask how these policies are working in California. And in that respect, maybe we can assist Governor Schwarzenegger in his goal of making California an example for the rest of the nation. Uh, not only is the governor's promise of the new era of green jobs failed to materialize, the impact of these restrictions on California's economy is nothing short of catastrophic. The governor uh, just imposed the biggest tax increase in the history of the country, uh, $13 billion for a state, uh, including increases in income, taxes, sales taxes, and the car tax, to make up for the revenues that are now being lost by the extraordinary uh, enterprise implosion in California. And as California's economy continues to implode, I think we're going to see Americans uh, rapidly coming to the conclusion that this probably isn't the smartest thing to do. You know, in normal times, people don't pay a lot of attention to public policy. That's why democracies occasionally drift off course. But when a crisis approaches, that's when you see a democracy engage. One by one, citizens sense the approach of a common danger, and they rise to the occasion. They focus, they look beyond the symbols and the rhetoric, and they begin to make very good decisions. Political majorities can shift very quickly in such times. Polls can reverse themselves almost overnight in such times, and I believe that that day is rapidly approaching. We've based our entire form of government on the assumption that when democracies engage, when people actually sit down, think things through carefully, pay attention to a public debate, that they start to make very good decisions. The radical policies now imposed on California are taking a dreadful toll on its economy and will become ever more dire in the days ahead. As the impact of these policies is felt, people will begin paying close attention to public policy making and the policy makers responsible, and then they'll begin exercising something that the majority of California's public officials have so completely lacked, simple common sense. Uh, Abraham Lincoln put it this way, he said, if the voters get their backsides too close to the fire, they'll just have to sit on the blisters for a while. Well, our nation's got some very painful blisters to sit on for a while, but in the process, because of organizations like Heartland, uh, like Coolidge's Ancient Mariner, a sadder but a wiser nation will wake the moral morn. Thank you very much.